Chapter Three. Where is Mrs. Hirsch? The days of September passed, one after the other, much the same. Emma Marie and Alan walked to school together and home again, always now taking the longer way, avoiding the tall soldier and his partner. Kirsty dawdled just behind them, or scampered ahead, never out of their sight. The two mothers still had their coffee together in the afternoons. They began to knit mittens as the days grew slightly shorter, and the first leaves began to fall from the trees because another winter was coming. Everyone remembered the last one. There was no fuel now for the homes and apartments in Copenhagen. And the winter nights were terribly cold. Like the other families in their building, the Johansons had opened the old chimney and installed a little stove to use for heat when they could find coal to burn. Mama used it too, sometimes for cooking, because electricity was rationed now. At night, they used candles for light. Sometimes Alan's father, a teacher, complained in frustration. Because he couldn't see in the dim light to correct his students' papers. Soon we will have to add another blanket to your bed, Mama said one morning as she and Anne Marie tidied the bedroom. Kirsty and I are lucky to have each other for warmth in the winter, Anne Marie said. Poor Alan to have no sisters. She will have to snuggle in with her Mama and Papa when it gets cold, Mama said, smiling. I remember when Kirsty slept between you and Papa. She was supposed to stay in her crib, but in the middle of the night, she would climb out and get in with you," Emery said, smoothing the pillows on the bed. Then she hesitated and glanced at her mother, fearful that she had said the wrong thing, the thing that would bring the pained look to her mother's face. The days when little Kirsty slept in Mama and Papa's room were the days when Lise and Emery shared this bed. But Mama was laughing quietly. I remember too, she said. Sometimes she wet the bed in the middle of the night. I did not, Kirsty said hotly from the bedroom doorway. I never ever did that. Mama, still laughing, knelt and kissed Kirsty on the cheek. Time to leave for school, girls, she said. She began to button Kirsty's jacket. Oh dear, she said softly. Look. This button has broken right in half. Anne Marie, take Kirsty with you after school to the little shop where Mrs. Hirsch sells thread and buttons. See if you can buy just one to match the others on her jacket. I'll give you some, Croner. It shouldn't cost very much. But after school, when the girls stopped at the shop, which had been there as long as Anne Marie could remember, they found it closed. There was a new padlock on the door and a sign, but the sign was in German. They couldn't read the words. I wonder if Mrs. Hirsch is sick, Emery said as they walked away. I saw her Saturday, Ellen said. She was with her husband and their son. They all looked just fine, or at least the parents looked just fine. The son always looks like her, she giggled. Emery made a face. The Hirsch family lived in the neighborhood, so they can see the boy Samuel often. He was a tall teenager with thick glasses, stooped shoulders, and unruly hair. He rode a bicycle to school, leaning forward and squinting, wrinkling his nose to notch his glasses into place. His bicycle had wooden wheels. Now that rubber tires weren't available, and it creaked and clattered on the street. I think the Hirsches all went on a vacation to the seashore," Kirsty announced. "And I suppose they took a big basket of pink frosted cupcakes with them," Emery said sarcastically to her sister. "Yes, I suppose they did," Kirsty replied. And Marie and Alan exchanged looks that meant, "Kirsty is so dumb." No one in Copenhagen had taken a vacation at the seashore since the war began. There were no pink frosted cupcakes. There hadn't been for months. Still, Emery thought, looking back at the shop before they turned the corner, where was Mrs. Hirsch? The Hirsch family had gone somewhere. Why else would they close the shop? 
Mama was troubled when she heard the news. Are you sure? She asked several times. We can find another button someplace. Emery reassured her. Or we can take one from the bottom of a jacket and move it up. It won't show very much. But it didn't seem to be the jacket that worried Mama. Are you sure the sign was in German? She asked. Maybe you didn't look carefully. Mama, it had a swastika on it. Her mother turned away with a distracted look. Emery, watch your sister for a few moments and begin to peel the potatoes for dinner. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Emery asked as her mother started for the door. I want to talk to Mrs. Rosen. Puzzled, Emery watched her mother leave the apartment. She went to the kitchen and opened the door to the cupboard where the potatoes were kept. Every night, now it seemed they had potatoes for dinner and very little else. Emery was almost asleep when there was a light knock on the bedroom door. Candlelight appeared as the door opened and her mother stepped in. Are you asleep, Emery? No, why? Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong. But I'd like you to get up and come out to the living room. Peter's here. Papa and I want to talk to you. Emery jumped out of bed, and Kirsty grunted in her sleep. Peter! She hadn't seen him in a long time. There was something frightening about his being here at night. Copenhagen had a curfew, and no citizens were allowed out after 8 o'clock. It was very dangerous, she knew, for Peter to visit at this time. But she was delighted that he was here. Though his visits were always hurried, they almost seemed secret somehow, in a way she couldn't quite put her finger on. And her parents loved Peter too. They said he was like a son. Barefoot, she ran to the living room and into Peter's arms. He grinned, kissed her cheek, and ruffled her long hair. You've grown taller since I saw you last, he told her. You're all legs. Emery laughed. I won the girls' foot race last Friday at school. She told him proudly. Where have you been? We've missed you. My work takes me all over, Peter explained. Look, I brought you something. One for Kirsty too. He reached into his pocket and handed her two seashells. Emery put the smaller one on the table to save it for her sister. She held the other in her hand. Turning it in the light, looking at the ridged, pearly surface, it was so like Peter to bring just the right gift. For your mama and papa, I brought something more practical. Two bottles of beer. Mama and papa smiled and raised their glasses. Papa took a sip and wiped the foam from his upper lip. Then his face became more serious. Emery, he said. Peter tells us that the Germans have issued orders, closing many stores run by Jews. Jews? Emery repeated. Is Mrs. Hirsch Jewish? Is that why the button shop is closed? Why have they done that? Peter leaned forward. It is their way of tormenting. For some reason, they want to torment Jewish people. It has happened in the other countries. They have taken their time here, have let us relax a little. But now it seems to be starting. But why the button shop? What harm is a button shop? Mrs. Hirsch is such a nice lady. Even Samuel. He's a dope, but he would never harm anyone. How could he? He can't even see with his thick glasses. Then Emery thought of something else. If they can't sell their buttons, how will they earn a living? It's what friends do. Emery nodded. Mama was right, of course. Friends and neighbors who would go to the home of the Hirsch family would take them fish and potatoes and bread and herbs for making tea. Maybe Peter would even take them a beer. They would be comfortable until their shop was allowed to open again. Then suddenly, she sat upright, her eyes wide. Mama, she said. Papa, the Rosens are Jewish too. Her parents nodded. Their face is serious and drawn. I talked to Sophie Rosen this afternoon after you told me about the button shop, Mama said. 
She knows what is happening, but she doesn't think that it will affect them. Emery thought and understood. She relaxed. Mr. Rosen doesn't have a shop. He's a teacher. They can't close a whole school. She looked at Peter with a question in her eyes. Can they? I think the Rosens will be all right, he said. But you keep an eye on your friend Alan and stay away from the soldiers. Your mother told me about what happened on Oster Brigade. Emery shrugged. She had almost forgotten the incident. It was nothing. They were only bored and looking for someone to talk to, I think. She turned to her father. Papa, do you remember what you heard the boy say to the soldier? That all of Denmark would be the king's bodyguard. Her father smiled. I have never forgotten it, he said. Well, Emery said slowly, now I think that all of Denmark must be bodyguard for the Jews as well. So we shall be, Papa replied. Peter stood. I must go, he said. And you, long legs, it is way past your bedtime now. He hugged Anne Marie again. Later, once more in her bed beside the warm cocoon of her sister, Anne Marie remembered how her father had said, three years before, that he would die to protect the king. That her mother would too. And Anne Marie, seven years old, had announced proudly that she also would. Now she was ten, with long legs, and no more silly dreams of pink frosted cupcakes. And now she and all the Danes were to be bodyguard for Alan and Alan's parents, and all of Denmark's Jews. Would she die to protect them? Truly, and Mary was honest enough to admit, there in the darkness, to herself, that she wasn't sure. For a moment, she felt frightened, but she pulled the blanket up higher around her neck and relaxed. It was all imaginary, anyway, not real. It was only the fairy tales that people were called upon to be so brave, to die for one another. Not in real life, Denmark. Oh, there were the soldiers, that was true. And the courageous resistance leaders who sometimes lost their lives, that was true too. But ordinary people like the Rosens and the Johansons, Emery admitted to herself, snuggling there in the quiet dark, that she was glad to be an ordinary person who would never be called upon for courage. Do you guys know that in Korean they say like to Hyodo before mom and dad die, and like that means catch the chance when there is a chance. I think Gloria Dump tell her. Be resilient. That's a really big word. My pick sentences is just ain't a party without pickles, but it can be a party without pickles. Funny. <gasps> a magic bag. Okay, that's it. When it is six o'clock, my mom took up the picture. It's me in the picture. I hope I can take off the mask soon. Because I can go to field trip at the school. Aurora. I really I want like to see it. Yes, like that. I saw many times. Yeah. My favorite book is just my friend and me. I like the Statue of Liberty. Just me and the friends. Luke's favorite was Skycaller.